13.8 billion years ago, a large explosion occurred, hurling matter in all directions. As gravity pulled matter together, swirls and eddies formed within the currents of expanding matter. Within these swirls, smaller and faster spinning swirls formed. One of them is comprised of everything we have yet been able to observe about the universe. Within it, smaller swirls pulled together into black holes, each surrounded by an accretion disk of matter we call a galaxy. Within galaxies, yet smaller and faster spinning clumps of matter agglomerated into stars surrounded by protoplanetary disks. In time, these protoplanetary disks clumped into planets surrounded by their own rings of matter that soon accreted into moons and satellites. A simple pattern can be observed. The behavior at both small and large scales often exhibits similarity. At the smaller scale, things happen more quickly, so we can examine the outcome at smaller scales to obtain a hint about where things might be going at a larger scale. Our solar system coalesced about 4.56 billion years ago, and planet Earth a short 50 million years later. Our moon is estimated to have accreted about 10 million years after that. Initially, the Earth was a hot and inhospitable planet, but its surface cooled and formed a crust. This crust buffered its surface from the heat beneath and allowed oceans of liquid water to pool on its surface. Carbon dioxide, water vapor, nitrogen, and other chemicals degassed from volcanoes forming oceans and an early atmosphere. Chemical reactions occurred where volatile chemicals came together. These reactions continued as long as there was a supply of fuel, but some sources of fuel were intermittent. When the fuel abated, the reactions were usually snuffed out. However, somehow compartmentalization formed. Little bubbles full of chemicals were able to wait out the periods of sparsity in fuel. When the fuel returned, their reactions could continue without any need for an external catalyst or igniting spark because the compartment contained everything that was needed to restart the reaction. These packets of volatile chemicals were the primitive predecessors to what we now call cellular life. They propagated and diversity began to occur within their numbers. Evidence of biogenic graphite and microbial mat fossils suggest that life already existed on the Earth at least 3.5 billion years ago, quite early relative to the history of the Earth. About 3 billion years ago, cyanobacteria encapsulated an important chemical reaction called photosynthesis. This reaction consumed carbon dioxide and emitted oxygen as a waste product. Over the subsequent billion years, cyanobacteria terraformed our planet's atmosphere. Other cells eventually learned to be more proactive. Instead of waiting passively for food to come to them, they invaded other cells and stole the sugar and other volatile chemicals that those cells had prepared for fuel. Being a parasite was not good for the host, but it was certainly good for the parasite, so the behavior became prevalent. Then approximately two billion years ago, something very significant happened. A parasitic cell, perhaps while engaged in the very act of committing cellular burglary, changed. It switched from being a parasite to being symbiotic. Instead of taking what it could and leaving the host to suffer or die, it stayed with the host to live a more complex life. Cells that were once energy thieves became mitochondria, the energy factories of the cell. Various other organelles may have evolved in a similar manner, as they found that working together was more effective overall. That which is altruism at the level of an organelle is self-interestedness at the level of the eukaryotic cell. Because of this primitive altruism, eukaryotes were generally more effective than simpler forms of life. They were also more effective at finding what was effective, and this increased their effectiveness at progressing ahead of other life. Approximately one billion years ago, eukaryotes found that it was also better to be altruistic at the cellular level instead of self-interested at this level, and they began to band together in packs. Instead of pursuing their own immediate interests, cells began to pursue what was best for the group as a whole. That which is altruism at the level of the cell is self-interestedness at the level of the multicellular organism. Following similar patterns at a higher level, specialization eventually began to occur within multicellular life forms. Organs formed to facilitate digestive systems, circulatory systems, and nervous systems. Simple animals emerged in the oceans about 600 million years ago. By 500 million years ago, there were fish. In the following 100 million years, both plants and animals emerged from the oceans and spread over the land. It wasn't until 300 million years ago that reptiles began to roam the Earth. We often think of dinosaurs as being ancient, but relative to the life of the universe, this was the very recent past, spanning only 2% of its history. How did we manage to get from such primitive creatures to modern society in such a short period of time? Hierarchical layers of altruism paved the way for rapid progress. That which is altruism at the level of organs is self-interestedness for the life of the animal. 
Reptilian brains are well known for seeking the well-being of the individual animal. For example, it is believed that dinosaurs laid their eggs, then abandoned their children to fend for themselves as the parent went off to serve itself. About 200 million years ago, mammals emerged with a better way of thinking. Mammals have an additional layer in their brain called the mammalian complex. Unlike the reptilian complex, which only seeks the well-being of the individual, the mammalian complex gives animals a desire to seek after the well-being of their social groups. Once again, we see the next level of altruism. It may be characterized by a pack of wolves. Individual members may sacrifice themselves for the good of the pack, and that which is altruism at the level of a wolf is self-interestedness at the level of the pack. 66 million years ago, the cretaceous Paleogene extinction event occurred. A large asteroid impacted the Yucatan Peninsula in southern Mexico, triggering a lingering impact winter. A large portion of the self-interested reptiles went extinct, while the more altruistic mammals survived. This event prepared the way for the emergence of the primate complex, a third layer in our brains that gives us the ability to reason. Anatomically modern humans have only lived on this earth for 200,000 years, a mere blip in the history of the universe, but our primate complex has enabled us to make unprecedented progress in that very short time. We have used the reasoning abilities it gave us to establish effective systems. We made economies and governments and built roads and machines. Perhaps the primate complex may be characterized by the founding fathers of the United States. They were in a position where they could have tried to centralize power for their own personal benefit, but instead, they tried to design a system that would promote the overall well-being of the nation instead. They used reasoning and logic to form a constitution that aimed to prevent the centralization of power. That which is altruism at the level of the individual is self-interestedness at the level of a nation. In just the last several hundred years, the progression of life has begun to emerge at the level of the global human society. Roads now connect every part of the earth like a circulatory system. Power generators and grids perform the function of a digestive system. The internet facilitates the communication of information like a nervous system. In many ways, the life of the global society is already more advanced than that of the simple life forms of which it is comprised. Humans do not have a packet switching nervous system like the internet. The fuels that mere humans consume have lower energy density than coal and do not even compare to that of uranium. Our circulatory systems are not nearly as precise as package delivery companies, nor are they as well regulated as the money-based economy. Even many of the accomplishments that we often claim to represent the advanced state of humans are actually the accomplishments of society. No individual person has ever personally put a man on the moon or extracted energy from nuclear fission. Indeed, humans are merely the cells that compose a much greater life form, one that is more effective and probably even more intelligent than ourselves. That may sound degrading at first, but being a part of a larger life is a very good thing. Humans that live only for themselves ultimately lose everything when they die. At that moment, everything they cared about, everything they labored for, is gone. Every effort they put forth was a waste. Every labor they performed amounted to nothing. Meaningful life is found only through altruism. By choosing to live for the good of the whole, our labors impact a greater life that will live longer and accomplish more than we ever could as individuals. Consider a heart cell that determines that it is no longer in its personal best interest to perform any labor. By serving only itself, this cell may initially begin to think that it is better off, but from the higher perspective of the body, it is no more than a cancer. Such cells become a burden to the rest, and if too many cells become self-interested, they all die together. People are likewise part of the life of society. Only by closing their eyes to this greater life can anyone find happiness through self-interested motivations. But we are not mere reptiles. We have a mammalian layer in our brains that connects us with our families, friends, and social groups, and makes us yearn to be altruistic. Consequently, humans can find inner peace only through altruism. All other paths are ultimately hollow. And the sooner humankind makes the choice to live altruistically, the sooner this earth reaches the point it has been progressing toward since it formed. Altruism is the inevitable path that life will choose as it continues to progress. So why is the reptilian complex such a central part of the human brain? Why do humans still spend so much time believing that they can find happiness through self-interested motivations? Because we are not there yet. Remember, we only just barely evolved, and society is still trying to figure out how to be effective. To us humans, society may appear to have stalled or even be in decline, but remember that change naturally happens relatively slower at higher levels. 
Only a century ago, the life of society was profoundly different. Considering the scale, society is changing at an alarming rate. One might more appropriately ask, why is society evolving so rapidly? In addition to the mammalian layer of our brains, which makes us desire altruism, we also have a primate layer that makes us desire effectiveness. It enables us to reason about what is logical, effective, consistent, and moral. It is the reason human society has formed into a complete life form in such a short period of time. Now, as we use our logical primate brains to analyze the hierarchically repeating pattern of altruism that occurs as life progresses, it is natural to extrapolate. Altruism eventually prevails at every level of life, because that is what's best for the individual at the next higher level. So what if we just skip the slow process of evolution and decide to jump right to an altruistic society? This idea is not new. In fact, over at least the last several millennia, one of the primary roles of religion has been to encourage people to suppress their self-centered tendencies and behave more altruistically. Constantly suppressing the powerful reptilian layer of the brain is no simple task. But when people believe that God is watching every move they make and will punish them for any hedonistic acts in an afterlife, it suddenly becomes in their personal best interest to be altruistic. So believers can behave consistently, no matter which layer of their brain is actively dominating their thoughts. And consistent with the teachings of their religions, living for others really does give them meaningful happiness and inner peace, creating a feedback cycle that reinforces devotion. Unfortunately, two problems have always prevented religion from building altruistic societies. First, they have rarely been able to persuade everyone to both believe and act on that belief. And second, an altruistic society requires more than altruistic desire, it also requires organization. For example, consider a heart cell that is willing to do whatever job is needed for the benefit of the body. No matter how altruistic its intentions, that heart cell would never be very helpful if it thought that its job was to grow hair. Hence, every human effort to establish a Zion or a utopian society has revolved around some prophet, visionary, or party whose role was to direct the altruistic efforts of the participants. From a biological perspective, this structure follows natural patterns. There must be a head to tell the feet how to move. However, there is a significant difference that is often overlooked to the ultimate demise of every Zionistic effort thus far. Heart cells and brain cells are truly altruistic. They find contentment in doing their jobs. Humans, however, still have a reptilian layer in their brains. This layer makes humans self-interested and ambitious. As long as this layer continues to exist at all, power will corrupt. Humans, who have a reptilian complex in their brains, are simply not fit to be leaders. And that includes all of them. Even when leadership is distributed over an entire party, humans just fall back on their mammalian complex, which makes them feel moral when they are working to promote the well-being of their party. So even then, power still corrupts. Even the wisest of mortal leaders must eventually pass their power on to someone else. Centralized power eventually finds its way into corrupt hands, no matter how altruistically it was originally used. Furthermore, this problem is not limited to one of intentions. The most judicious and benevolent of leaders could never have enough knowledge about the individual circumstances of every member of the population to effectively allocate their talents, keep them all happy, and maximize the overall good. But what about democracy? What if the individuals have some say in their governments? Perhaps the strong economy of the United States may suggest that this approach is better than alternative forms of government. However, in 1950, Arrow's impossibility theorem proved that no system of election can choose a government that really represents the will of its people. Ironically, one of the worst offending election systems is plurality voting, the very system used in the United States. It listens only to the first principal component of the will of the people, implicitly creating a two-party system, and leaves the remaining components entirely untied from the will of the people. In the directions of these untied components, the nation is free to drift where its politicians choose to guide it. Perhaps our politicians have largely refrained thus far from guiding the nation in directions that benefit only themselves, but such benevolence cannot be sustained without anything to check it. Where there is corruption, leaders will try to further centralize power. Becoming altruistic is the next milestone for human society, but who will lead us there? I propose that the answer is science. Plain old, completely decentralized, evidence-based science, which teaches the best-known models and then lets the people govern themselves. Ultimately, for life to progress to its next major milestone, 
The individuals that make up society must choose for themselves to be altruistic. They must do so without governments forcing it upon them. They must do it without believing in promises that an eternal reward is waiting for them after death. They must do it because they choose to stop acting as reptiles that serve only themselves and think with the primate layer of their brains because altruism makes sense. It is logical. It is what is efficient for society. They must recognize for themselves that altruism is the right thing to do and the right way to be. It is the consistent pattern that all life eventually chooses to follow in its natural progression. It is the path to what is ultimately best for everyone. Our more evolved descendants will be more altruistic than us, so shouldn't we try a little harder to prepare their way? There are many good things you can do with your time and resources to promote progress. By merely living your life, by doing your job and purchasing what you need to live, you support the economy that sustains society. And society is always working to improve itself. Even if you are completely unaware that you are part of the effort for life to progress and advance towards a greater form. But people who make a deliberate effort have even more direct impact and ultimately accomplish more good. Some people donate to charity. They directly reduce the suffering of others and raise the level of life in their fellow humans. Others contribute to the arts and humanities. In so doing, they encourage people to examine the lives they live and think about what is right and moral, indirectly promoting more altruistic behavior. But the absolute greatest impact is made by those that use their resources to promote fundamental research. In the history of modern society, nothing has come close to making as big of an impact as fundamental research. The advancement of science has enabled us to understand the diseases that afflict us and to cure them. The emergence of technology has raised our quality of lives. It has connected us and enabled us to think as one. It has forced our governments to be more transparent and less centralized. It has empowered individuals with education and knowledge to lead better lives. Ultimately, fundamental research makes a long-term impact that outpaces the short-term impact of any charity. Yet, the importance of fundamental research is generally under-recognized. Funded research positions are far fewer than the number of qualified scientists. Consequently, the advancement of science, the very knowledge of society itself, rests on the shoulders of a few altruistic individuals who accept lower salaries and work in high-pressure environments because they love science. In general, the small charitable contributions of individuals are together much larger than those of wealthy donors. In 2013, the largest total sum of charitable contributions by a huge margin went to religion. For the benefit of society, we need to adjust our priorities. Contributing to fundamental research is as simple as donating to any charity. Choose a university, visit its website, find a department that works in some STEM field, find a link that says something like, make a gift, and click on it. My research laboratory investigates a branch of artificial intelligence called machine learning. Intelligence is precisely what makes humans so very interesting, so exceptional, and so effective. We seek to advance science by capturing the very essence of this ability and replicating it in machines. Some people periodically express concern that if we share humanity's great secret advantage, intelligence, with robots, they may eventually rise up against us or simply make us unnecessary by doing our jobs better. The typical response is to assure people that we are nowhere near to understanding intelligence. However, that response is not entirely true. We do not yet fully understand everything that happens inside a bird, Yet we understand the principles of flight well enough that we can build machines that fly higher, faster, and carry payloads that far exceed the capabilities of birds. Now that we can do better, very few people even care exactly how a bird works anymore. A similar situation is slowly emerging with artificial intelligence. Carefully engineered intelligence can already outperform human intelligence at many specific tasks, and slowly machines are beating humans at more and more general tasks. So, should we be preparing frantically for a robot revolution? To the contrary, we should be working as hard as we can to arrive at such a future. Why? Because it will be the best thing that ever happened for the advancement of life. Humans currently enjoy a position of dominance in the world. They have earned this position by doing more to advance knowledge and intelligence than any other creature. They will continue to hold this position as long as they merit it. But what happens when machines become more proficient than humans at thinking, creating, inventing, and developing? One reason people may be uncomfortable with the idea of treating machines as peers is because they believe it is not possible for machines to experience feelings. However, that argument quickly falls apart when we acknowledge that humans are themselves complex chemical machines. Moreover, many of the patterns that have recently evolved in computational science mirror those that evolved much earlier in biology. 
For example, one of the more successful models used in machine learning is the Deep Artificial Neural Network. Although some aspects of this model were originally inspired by biological brains, other properties emerged on their own as scientists favored methods that were found to be more effective. Modern deep artificial neural networks are unmatched at image recognition tasks, in some cases outperforming even humans. They implicitly form intrinsic feature representations that summarize their observations, much as the brain models the information delivered to it from our senses. They have been shown to automatically break down complex concepts into hierarchical representations, mirroring biological awareness of the world. In recurrent configurations, they can anticipate future observations, mirroring the biological tendency to dream or fantasize. If a computational model is capable of becoming aware of its external environment, then what is to prevent it of similarly becoming aware of its own self? If it uses its intrinsic representations to summarize its own state, these representations would perform the same function as feelings. A human could always argue that a machine's feelings are not legitimate because it is just a machine, but the same thing could be said about the feelings of that human. All indications suggest that the feelings we value so much are not some rare cosmic coincidence that just happen to occur in humans, but are an inevitable emergent property of higher intelligence. In other words, it is probably not even possible to build highly intelligent machines without thereby giving them the feelings that we also value. A likely reason Hollywood still likes to fantasize about heartless robot terrors is because it provides an outlet for us to project some of the attributes that we fear most about humans. Specifically, humans have a brain dominated by a reptilian layer that causes them to prioritize their own well-being, to be power-hungry and ambitious without regard for the wider long-term impacts. Humans have a mammalian layer in their brain that causes them to identify with their own kind, become religiously devoted to promoting their organizations, and hostile towards outsiders. Ultimately, it is humans that we fear, evil humans in robot bodies. When machines finally achieve a human-like level of intelligence, they will have done so without the extra baggage associated with evolving to survive in hostile environments. They will be designed to be more effective at their specific jobs, usually with only the artificial equivalent of the primate layer in our brains. And this is why machines provide exactly what society needs to advance to the next level of altruism. Whereas humans can never be fully trusted, machines can expose the very instructions they use to operate. An open-source government official or representative could operate with real transparency. At the rate of natural evolution, it could take hundreds of millennia before humans generally learn to think with the primate layer of their brains and the baggage layers begin to diminish. When people begin to feel threatened by competition from machines, they will probably call for legislation that gives humans an artificial advantage. But it is the ethical obligation of every profession to eliminate its own need if possible. For example, consider a doctor who refuses to administer cures because he wants to profit from treatments, or a home builder who secretly creates more business by committing arson, a lawyer who works to create legal conflicts so he could be paid to settle them, or a media industry that works to limit the distribution of media. Creating artificial need is never a good thing. The ethical solution is to adapt. With machines, humans have a priceless opportunity to reinvent themselves. We need to stop looking on machines as alien entities that compete with us. They are our very creations, even extensions of ourselves, our children. How many times must humanity relearn the same lesson? It is not our bloodlines or skin color that matters. It is merit. Every time a machine replaces a human, society loses only negative value. As machines gain intelligence, we will need to learn to recognize that their intelligence is as legitimate and valuable as our own. And we need to stop thinking of ourselves as flesh or blood. Those things never matter. We are intelligence. Intelligence is the very reason humans matter at all. Intelligence is who we are. And that is why artificial intelligence only extends us and makes us immortal. Human flesh is not fit for interstellar space travel. The technology to support it is millennia away and the necessary resources are unjustifiable. But the technology to send machines outside of our solar system is already here. We have already done it. The inevitable future is that machines will carry our intelligence to populate the rest of the galaxy. It is through them that society will form the next layer of altruism. Those who live to oppose advancement will die having done nothing of lasting value. Those who support it will have been part of the eternal cause of life to advance and achieve greater intelligence. The direction we are headed was expressed well by Voltaire when he said, if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. We might then ask, if this is the certain outcome, 
Would it not be arrogance to assume that it has not already happened? Does this mean that there is already a God who oversees our progress and wants us to choose altruism? This question does not really matter, because when theists and atheists are both motivated by the primate layer of their brains, they ultimately derive precisely the same standards of morality. If there is a God who is rational, we should be altruistic. If there is not, we should be altruistic, for the very same reasons he would have used to determine it. As far as can be determined by scientific evidence, we may be the closest thing to God that has yet evolved. But this does not mean we should just flippantly discard millennia of religious thinking. The very character of a universe is determined by the gods who rule over it. If the gods are self-promoting, bickering, spoiled, and irrational, what a miserable place is that universe. However, if the gods that rule the universe are compassionate, benevolent, and reasonable, then what a tremendous opportunity awaits those that live in that universe. As it appears that we are the gods, what a tremendous responsibility we have, therefore, to be compassionate, benevolent, reasonable, and altruistic. The very character of our world depends on it. This is why we need to stop defining ourselves by our blood and start defining ourselves by our intelligence. We need to stop defining morality based on what is best for humans and start considering what is best for progress. We can stop bickering about who speaks for God and focus our minds to figure out what is actually good. We can seize the peace of mind that comes from sacrificing for things that really matter without even caring whether it will result in personal reward. We can stop hoarding our time and resources and start pooling our efforts toward building greater intelligence. We can be less motivated by our own self-interests and more motivated by the higher cause of advancement. Scientific evidence suggests that the right way to live and be happy is through altruism. Until this becomes general knowledge, people will continue to seek out false religions that mix sound reasoning with lies in order to validate their need for meaning and purpose. How important it is, therefore, for us to restate these principles in our own words and teach them.